So we're all set to begin? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, this is a hearing in a matter of the complaint filed by Ethan Fry and the Valley of Independent Sentinel versus the Commissioner, State of Connecticut Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection, and State of Connecticut Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection. It's document number 2016. 0071. We note for the record that this hearing is going to be on May 18, 2016, at approximately 9.33 a.m. I am Tracy Brown. As interesting from the parties, I have been redesignated as the hearing officer in this matter for the opportunity to um, And uh, for the record, if you could just start by identifying yourselves, please. Uh, Ethan Fry from the Valley Independent Sentinel. Triple Michael Evangelist from the State Police. And Assistant Attorney General Stephen Sarnowski representing the Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection in this matter. Okay, thank you. Good morning, John. So, the way we proceed this morning, um, well, I'll start by saying based upon what transpires here today, I will write a hearing as a hearing officer's report. It will contain findings of fact and conclusions of law and scientific copy. Um, my report will be submitted to the full commission. They meet typically every second or fourth Wednesday of every month. You have an opportunity to appear before the commission to argue for or against anything that I write in that report. Uh, we're limited to legal arguments, and it's important that we get all the facts and evidence on the record today. Mr. Fry, you have an opportunity to present your case, basically um, identifying your records request, what you asked, and what happened subsequent to your request will be subject to cross examination by the respondents if they have any questions. The respondents will be on your defense and witnesses that they have to conduct this exam as well. I will interject and ask my own questions to make sure that I understand the testimony and evidence that is being presented clearly so I can make an informed decision. And I'm certainly going to answer any procedural questions that you're still going to have. Do you have any? No, no. Okay, so um, what we typically do at this point is turn the tape recorder off because we don't want it running uh, while we're trying to stipulate, if we can, to any documents that I don't know that there are very many. So you may not want to turn the tape recorder off if you can do it quickly, but I know there is at least a request, some sort of response that you receive via email from, I think it's a, is it First Flash Trooper? Um, so there's that, and I don't know if there's anything else. No, yeah, yeah the, the the request and the response, the like I think there was like a, the chain of emails that was like my initial request and the response. That's pretty much it as far as. That's what I want from. Did I provide in Mr. Fry copies? Just yeah, he gave. Okay. So, so can I mark those? Uh, sure. This okay. here's a copy of the original. So you want to just describe them as I like, yes. run them across to you. The first exhibit is, the, uh, as Mr. Fry has indicated, a trail of email messages from him to Trooper First Cast Class Kelly Grant, the State Police Public Information Officer. Okay, you can mark that as response exhibit one. Second is you don't have an objection, I should No, I'm sorry. Just make sure you don't have to the Second is an email from Christina Lussier, who is the administrative assistant for the Legal Affairs Department for the Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection. Okay. Do you have an objection to this committee? No. Okay. That's two. Yes, I'm sorry, that's two. Uh, three is an email from J. Doug Rosso, an attorney in the Legal Affairs Unit for the Department of Emergency Services. Lieutenant with the... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, you're wrong. Yeah. Lieutenant with Professional Standards Bureau in uh, Destin. And that's dated March 25th. Okay, thank you. This year. Do you have any objections? No, no standard? objections, sorry. Okay, that's fine. So that's my as responded to Exhibit 3. And Exhibit 4 is a letter to Mr. Fry from Trooper Evangelisti. Explain the need for a $60 statutory fee in order to obtain police reports on the date of March 31st of 2016. No objection. Thank you.
So those are on record, then? Have that with us? I think so. Okay. So those are going to testify here. Please stand and raise your hand. Thank you. Do you sign this right at the testimony as your hand today? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope you got it. Yeah, Thank you. Do please take a seat. And then for the record, please state your name, spell your last name, and confirm that you've taken the uh, Ethan Fry, F R Y is the last name I have taken the oath. Thank you very much. I have taken the oath, Trooper Michael Evangelist, E V A N G E L I S T I. Thank you very much. Who will proceed? Uh, yeah, basically, uh, Ansonia police officer uh, shot a person uh, in January 2000, February 2014. Uh, the person was eventually arrested. After that person's criminal case was disposed of, we asked, uh, dur like the, the, during the pendency of the case, um, the state police had testified that they were working on a use of force report about the Ansonia police officers, uh, whether it was justified or not, basically. And um, after the criminal case was disposed of, we requested the use of force report from the state police. Uh, public Information Office. They directed us to the Records and Reports Office, and they said we'd have to fill out a form, send $16, and then wait up to six months to get the report. And we basically think uh, we should get the report in less than six months. We, I don't think six months is a reasonable amount of time for the public to learn whether an officer was justified in shooting someone. And that's basically it. Mr. Fry, if I understand your testimony correctly, and I just get the facts, uh, background straight, the shooting that you refer to with the Ansonia police officer occurred on February 2nd of 2014. Is that correct? I think that's correct, yeah. Either February, yeah, February 2nd. All right. And that particular shooting was investigated uh, by several agencies. First of all, by the Ansonia Police Department because it was their officer who was involved in the shooting. Is that right? I believe so. And the criminal investigation associated with the shooting, which is obviously typically done in these cases, was conducted by the Connecticut State Police. If you say so, you don't. You don't know. I, 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 you know. I, I know they investigated it, but I'm, I, you know, I, I don't know whether. I'm not familiar with who, the nature. Who was the, yeah, the mechanics of like who was the charging agency? Or whatever. Yeah. And your request under the Freedom of Information Act for a copy of the investigative report was uh, on January 13 of 2016. Is that right? Uh, yes. Approximately two years after the incident. Yes. And during that interim, did you follow up with the Ansonia Police Department or obtain the reports that you were looking for from any other source, either in whole or in part? Uh, I don't think I requested or obtained any records uh, from the Ansonia Police about this. All right, I think my editor, I think they <coughs> sent him uh, a letter that the state's attorney, Kevin Lawler, had, had sent to the police chief of Ansonia, saying that there was uh, no criminal aspect to the, to the, as far as like the officers uh, shooting of the man. But uh, I don't think that we received any other reports about the incident. Are you aware that there is a statute that requires the state's attorney, in this case, Kevin Lawler, as you mentioned, to complete a, a review of all police involved shootings and to write a report concerning whether or not there's criminal activity. Uh, one of Trooper Grant's emails alluded to that, yeah. That's, that's how I, I knew that the, in, in cases where uh, the use of deadly force resulted in deaths, like the state's attorney's office has, like the website has uh, all of the reports concerning those posted, and one of Trooper Grant's emails uh, mentioned that, but I don't think the, uh, I think that's only involving deaths and not just like a per person was shot that didn't die. You, you allude to a letter from Kevin Lawler indicating that they had looked into, mm -hmm. they being the state's attorney's office, the facts and circumstances of this particular shooting. 
and determined that the police officer had not committed a crime, correct? I believe that's the con I, I haven't seen the, that letter. My editor got it, so I, I haven't seen it with my own eyes, but that's the substance of it is what, what I understand. Yes, my question really was, was that just a letter, or was that actually a copy of an investigative report from the state's attorney's office containing great number, if not all of the details of the shooting. I believe it was just a, a basic letter. I'm not, I'm not sure. All right, so on January 13, 2016, you sent the email, which is Respondents Exhibit 1, to Trooper Kelly Grant, the public information officer at the state police, correct? Yes. What effort, if any, did you make after sending this email on January 13th of 2016 to follow up and determine uh, where the state police was in, in researching and providing reports in response to your request? Well, Trooper Grant replied saying the report would have to come from the Records and Reports Division. So I called them and they said, uh, you know, fill out the form, send $16, and then wait up to six months. Um, and then I emailed Trooper Grant saying, like, why can't we get the report in fewer than six months, basically? Um, and she, like, there was, she replied saying that uh, she spoke to like the legal affairs office and that, uh, I forget the exact terminology, but you know, you, I, we could file an FOI request for it um, or contact reports and records, so we filed the FOI request. Right. Did you ever pay the $16 no. fee? I didn't fill out the form. So, other than that conversation with Trooper Grant, where you decided that, and I think you said you did not actually fill out the form and make the request to the state police reports and records. No. You chose instead to make a freedom of information request. Yes. But you did not pay the $16 fee for the report. No. What other contact, if any, did you have in order to follow up as to the status of your request? Uh, that was pretty much it. I filed the FOI request, uh, and then four days passed and I didn't hear anything, so I filed the FOI complaint. And then uh, a few weeks later, uh, when the, the, this uh, proceeding was docketed, I got a, a letter from the Trooper Evangelist saying that like, I think I found the report, but I mean, this was already scheduled, so I decided to just come here. And the letter that you got from Trooper Evangelist, is that responding to Exhibit 4? Uh, yep, that's it. All right, and that letter indicates that there is a statutory fee of $16, which you need to pay. Mm -hmm. You see that? Yep. And have you paid the fee, sir? No, I haven't. No further questions. Uh, I guess if, if the $16 fee is a, a sticking point, we could pay that. I think, like our concern is just the, the time frame of associated with the with our request. Again, like it's a, it's a it's a matter of you know it, it, it's a big issue. I guess in the you know throughout the country right now, whether police involved shootings are justified, and uh, you know thankfully it hasn't been an issue around here as much. Mm -hmm. But I think the public should not have to wait six months to get that information, or up to six months. assigned to the Legal Affairs Unit. I've been there since October of 2014, and I've been with the Connecticut State Police since January of 2007. All right. And if you can recall or refer to the exhibits, when did you first become involved in the Freedom of Information request uh, that brings us here today, filed by Mr. Fry? I personally received the file on March 30th, 2016, from uh, our, our Unit Secretary, Ms. Lucier, and I drafted a letter after reviewing the emails on just the next day, March 31st, 2016, just to confirm that that was a report that uh, Mr. Fry was looking for. 
and uh, seeking a $16 statutory fee so I could uh, then proceed with his request. All right. Uh, as you've heard from the testimony previously, this particular Freedom of Information request was first filed on uh, January 13th of 2016. I'm wondering if you have any knowledge as to why it took so long from January 13th of 2016 to get to your attention in March of 2016. Based on the email chain that was uh, provided in the file to me, I'm going to call which exhibit, I think it's exhibit two. Uh, from Lieutenant Del Grosso. Ms. Lucier, the secretary, first sent it to our Professional Standards Bureau because it was indicated that it was a use of force report, which typically the Professional Standards Bureau handles all use of force reports uh, within our agency. So I think she sent it there first, which kind of extended the time period a little bit until they found out there was actually a major crime investigation because it was for a local police department. When there's a, a local police department involved shooting or serious use of force, they'll sometimes call out our major crime unit to come help out and do evidence, photographs, statements, because uh, when it's an investigation of that magnitude, they, they definitely need the assistance for, uh, for cases of that manner. So that's when we found out there was actually a major crime investigation, and that's when I sent the letter to uh, Mr. Fry. And did you find out anything uh Having been involved in this case concerning why it took so long for from January 13th to uh, March 22nd, I believe, for Ms. Lossier to send a letter to the uh, Internal Affairs people looking for this, this report. She's had an issue with her out, outlook at the, uh, the Legal Affairs Unit for some time now, and they've been looking into it. And I believe there's a uh, trouble taking a punch for that. I don't have the number for a trouble ticket, but I know it's been addressed. That where she would open an email, the email below it would also mark as read. Now I've seen her email inbox, and the last time I saw it was somewhere around 25,000 emails. So it's uh, quite voluminous. But, um, so your understanding is that if she opens one email, the next email is automatically or inadvertently marked as having been read as well. Yes. And is that the reason, or do you understand if that's to the best of my knowledge? That's the reason. So it was missed for that reason. And what is it that called attention back to it that brought this thing back on track? And once it's been missed, it's off the radar screen, so to speak. How did it get back on the radar screen? I would have to say the complaint. So it caused the agency to look further as to where this request was. Yes, what is the agency practice with regard to requests for state police reports for which the statutory fee of $16 has not been paid? We wouldn't put all. We, we wait until uh, 29-10B was fulfilled and then we would pass along to reports and records so that they could actually give us a copy of the records to be reviewed. Because under 29-10B, it's a statutory fee for not just a copy of the report, but actually also for the search and the construction of it. Um, you sent your letter to Mr. Fry, as if I've heard the testimony correctly and read the exhibits correctly, on March 31st of 2016. Yes, sir. What efforts, if any, did you make following March 31st of 2016 to contact Mr. Fry to determine whether he still wanted the report, was, was capable of willing to pay the $16, or was he still interested in this whole matter? None by e email or mail. Um, yesterday, I believe I tried calling an office line number, but I wasn't able to reach anybody. I don't exactly remember what time. But I did not make any contact with Mr. Fry during that period. And had Mr. Fry made any contact with you after you wrote the letter on March 31st, 2016, letting him know that there was a $16 fee involved? No, he did not. But I did check with uh, reports and records both on May 16th and 
April 26 to see if he had actually filed a request with them separately so we didn't have two requests going at the same time or if I could go down there and try to help expedite it. And what did you find out about the separate requests? There were no separate requests made to reports and records directly. All right. um, assuming that the $16 fee had been paid, what do you know about the delay in researching and producing reports involved in the reports and records unit? Like most state agencies, uh, we're pretty stressed right now. I know reports and records division is beyond stressed. They handle tens of thousands of requests a year. I'm assuming, and it's just an estimate from just speaking to uh, the head on Monday, somewhere around like 60 plus thousand requests a year for reports. And there's only X amount of people that work inside that, inside that unit. And there's no overtime authorized because of budget concerns. And so the queue just keeps getting stacked and stacked and stacked. And the, uh, the delay just keeps getting larger, unfortunately. So I'm assuming it's like seven, about seven months. It was six months when uh, I believe it was when Mr. Fry spoke to them. It has to be at least seven months now. All right, and the reason for that delay is because the manpower Sheer is magnitude of the request is the manpower. All right, thank you. That's all. Um, I guess of, of all those, of this, you know, 60,000 requests per year, do you know how many uh, involve police-involved shootings? I absolutely do not. I'm sorry. And do you know, um, like, is there any procedure within the state police in terms of, uh, like, the public information office? Uh, that guides them as to whether they release reports or not to the public? Um, or do they just automatically refer all requests for reports to the reports and records? I would believe any reports would have to go through the records division because Cynthia Powell is the head of the records division. She's technically the, uh, the keeper of records. Anytime we're subpoenaed for the keeper of records, it would go directly to them. I believe any time a report is released, even for a subpoena, it goes straightly through the records division. So, like the state police public information office? They would have to go through the records division. They've yes. never released an uh, investigative report to the public? I have no clue. Thank you. That's it. Well, I think normally speaking, Everyone's request for a report is very important to them. So it's hard to know which one is objectively more important than the next. They tend not to make those judgments unless for some reason someone has uh, prompted them to do so. Um, generally speaking, they go into a queue that's you know, chronological in nature and they deal with the oldest, oldest ones first. And, um, again, we're very familiar, I'm sure, with, with the budget crisis in the state of Connecticut. There are no new hires, there are no layoffs, there is no overtime. Um, there's only so much manpower with 60,000 requests for reports, some of which are three page reports, some are worth, or, which are 300 page reports with photographs and electronic media and all the other complications. Um, it's, it's, there's a backlog that's uh, unfortunate, but Avoidable given the resources available. Do you know the needs of the public and how large this is? I don't know exact number of pages because, as Trooper Evangelist testified, they don't do the search unless the $16 is paid. But I do know that officer involved shooting investigations are complex, voluminous. Um, this would be hundreds of pages with photographs and and electronic media, videos, and that sort of thing. It would not be a small report. They know it would be a large and comprehensive document. Mm -hmm. Would your client specifically the records unit object to this kind of all the others in the I can always ask the colonel if they're willing to make an exception. <coughs> they did that, and you got it. Of at least two weeks, three weeks, if it's a big document like that. Would you withdraw this complaint? I mean, and you still have to pay the $16. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, if we got it and it 
timely fashion. I, I, I would have to consult with my editor, I guess, before making like a, a final decision. Okay, so just the situation in this particular case, you haven't paid the fee, so they kind of like, you know, off the hook. Mm -hmm. um, in order for us to get into a timeliness issue, whether or not they took a long time or not, you have to actually have to make the request to get going if they haven't done it. So, um, I, I really like be able to be generated, that would be better than you walking in there with nothing. Um, but they'd be withdrawn and a nicer resolution to the whole process. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly willing to help facilitate to see if we can get it to them sooner once the $16 dollars fees I know there's been obviously some time, so I'm not going to ask it. I'm not in a position to make yeah. promises because it's not my agency. Okay, so but it's not a very small question for certain things. Can I um, then ask that the matter be continued until we have communication between all three, between the owner, um, whether or not you do the queue ahead and then how long they anticipate that to take? If you provide that information to me and to Mr. Fry, you and your editor need to make a decision on whether or not the timeline is acceptable. So if it's four weeks, if it's six weeks, I guess I would, like I would only note that it's uh, it's been two years and yes. six months or yeah. two years at least uh, not a math major two years and three months since the incident itself and like I would note the difference you know everybody's request is important but I would note the difference between a fender bender on Route Eight in the middle of the night and a police officer shooting a person I mean this is uh, you know th these are matters where you know, if the person uh, dies, like the, the state's attorney goes, you know, goes to the step of presenting a full report, putting it on the internet, making it available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to anybody who wants it. Yet, when if a, per, if a police officer uses deadly force and a person doesn't die, uh, you have to go through all this you know, records request yeah. and things like that. I just. I think that's sort of, I mean, you set up barriers to the public to yeah. get information. Just, I do if that's the way things are, then that's I the way things that, are. I'm just trying to say, um, you know, there's some advantages and disadvantages to the way the department manages um, their records with us. And first in time, first in line, it seems to be able to do it. And don't have people screaming about the line. There's no quick doors. That have colorful arguments on each side. So I think that if you are willing to do that, I will continue to do that and hold off on your remarks before you give the response an opportunity to speak to your clients so that they're able and willing to do it, then you need to make a decision whether or not you're going to accept that as a form of settlement and you're going to try to go with it. If not, let me know yeah, yeah. and I'll run here and I'll search with you. I just want to make clear, are we waiting to hear first whether Mr. Fry and his newspaper is willing to accept this as an accommodation before we do the work, or we'll be doing the work well, think, and then finding no, out that it was for just, nothing? No, I think you actually just first find out whether the client is willing to, to move everybody, move his request ahead, and then to give sort of a time frame in which records might be reduced. That way they have something to decide on. I mean, if they, okay. you know, they have something to think about. And, uh, yeah, we'll pay the $16. And right, and then once you say it. yes, you got to pay the $16 yeah, yeah, yeah. first, then they conduct the search, and then the time for production, or whether it's four weeks or six weeks, we start from the time you pay the $16. That's how I'm thinking. Right, that makes sense. Okay. I just know in terms of like the search, like the, like the the existence of the report, I don't think is in question. So. No, no, no. So it's just basically a, a 
copy fee, fee, I guess. It's, it's $16, and there's no other fee for the documents. Whether it's two Out of the office, I apologize yesterday. Uh, cell phone. Is your email the same as? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, then I'll, what I'll just do is I'll Got put it. everybody on an email chain so everyone's up front. Okay. That right. That's good. Yes. Okay. I think it's fine. Much better. Perfect. So we'll do it by email, right? Yes. Right. Of course. Perfect. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So just hit it. Yeah, just, uh, just hit it again. Actually. 